Ah, uh, great, great, great. Perfect. Okay. Well, it looks like we're ready. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, it. Uh, I think for the participants from Asia, thanks a lot for coming. It's too late. <laughs> and uh, if you're locked at home, maybe it's a program interesting for the night. <laughs> but hello from the people uh, from US. Good morning. Uh, in Europe, good afternoon. So happy to have all of you here. I'm Danny, uh, Manager Director of iBlue Europe, and uh, I'm based in Barcelona. So on another side, we have Pierre. Hello, Pierre. Hi, everyone. Yeah. So thanks a lot, Pierre, for making effort and arrange everything. <laughs> it, it's quite incredible you can be in this session. Uh, being a new father just yesterday, <laughs> congrats. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, it's cool. It's uh, the topic really, um, when we choose it, we had a lot of internal and external discussion. I think it's worth to openly share um, our ideas and uh, what in our eyes opportunity. Uh, for the audience and uh, we hope for the best for the lockdown situation and the future of uh, all of us uh, the the quality of life and the, and the progress in all the business so i will pass the stage to pierre to start the session sure thing um so good morning good afternoon everyone um this is pierre speaking so the reason why I really wanted to, to insist on making it today is because I'm based in Shanghai. So this is a, obviously a topic that is uh, directly and personally uh, concerning me. And I wanted to, to, to share uh, on this topic. So just to introduce myself, if we can directly go on, the, on today's uh, presenter slide, slide number two. Uh, just a, a quick word um, about uh, Danny first. Uh, as you probably know, Danny is the managing director of iBlue Europe. Uh, previously used to work in luxury and now um, uh, six years ago founded uh, iBlue in Europe. So iBlue is an international uh, Chinese communication agency focusing on, uh, on luxury and cosmetics. And we're working uh, directly with China where we have our headquarters and I'm based basically in iBlue uh, Europe as the, um, as the brand director. So I've been in China for um, about 15 years, uh, back and forth uh, between Shanghai and Hong Kong. So always working for um, communi brand communication agencies. And uh, so we also have a, a little, little quote from Victor, our, our CEO, the CEO of uh, iBlue that kind of introduces the, the topic. Um, not sure he could make it today, but he wanted to, to, to share this uh, with, with all of us. The lockdown is brutal for all brands, but creates opportunities for some to stand out. And this is exactly what we're going to uh, delve into throughout this session. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and, and, and talk and run you through the agenda of, of today. We have four parts. Um, the first uh, is kind of a, a snapshot of uh, what, uh, what China is going through right now. Then we'll go through the, the consumer insights how brands are reacting and then the future opportunities uh, that are obviously very interesting for, 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 for all of us. So as we progress through the agenda, please uh, do feel free to drop your questions in the, in, we have a little chat comment section and our team, uh, including Danny, will be able to answer, um, to make it as, uh, as interactive as possible. So don't hesitate. And I think we can just go ahead and start with the, the first session. Uh, which we call China on hold. So at this stage, it's clear that um, how coronavirus is handled has big implication on the world and um, has come to, to rely so heavily in China, but also now more than, uh, than ever, um, an impact on every facet of Chinese people's lives. So this first part, uh, like I said, we'll, we'll take a look, a quick overview on the current status quo and where things are uh, where things are at right now in China. So you might have heard that uh, things are reopening a little bit lately in some very small specific areas of big cities. But overall, we're still very much uh, um, under our lockdown uh, circumstances. So in big cities like Shanghai or, or Beijing, so we're talking about the widest lockdown restrictions since 2020. 
um, more than 400 million people affected in some sort of a lockdown in April this month. So just to give you an idea, that's more than three quarters of the entire European population, 50 million people affected by strict COVID restrictions, 45 cities, 28 provinces. So this is a, a nationwide uh, a situation that we're, that we're facing here. So um, those measures uh, affect the economy through three main disruption. The first one uh, being obviously a consumption drop with um, people prioritizing first necessity goods like food, like drinks, um, which is the direct consequence of a supply chain lockdown that provoked major food shortages. It's also uh, massively affecting the, the port uh, activities of Shanghai, the port of Shanghai, which made the shipping cost increase and affected the rest of the world as well. Of course, um, the factory shut down, although China tried, you know, this closed loop management with workers sleeping at the factory, but the output rarely exceeded 20 to 30% capacity. So all this provoking a, a pretty, pretty steep drop in the, in the GDP with the, um, the IMF anticipating a 4.2% uh, growth against the 5.5% anticipated by China. It's pretty much half of China's GDP last year at the very same period. And if we go on the next slide, we can see how this directly uh, translates very concretely on, on how uh, this affects foreign brands in China. So here's just a snapshot of Tmall transactions for April this year versus April 2021. So we've got, I mean, just as an example, like Bulgari dropping by 92%, Zara uh, minus 65%, Hermes minus 52%, same for Lululemon. However, what's interesting is we also see Estee Lauder dropping only 7% and L'Oreal Paris just by 4%. I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting, you know, to see that the ones that suffer the least are the ones that have early on adapted to a strong target diversification uh, strategies and tackling lower tier cities that are currently less affected by those uh, mandated lockdowns. So, um, we've got a, a major drop in consumption and uh, no one can really predict uh, when the restriction will be lifted. So the big questions, and also I suppose that the reason you're probably here with us right now is how anxious should we be right now for our brands? Um, and what are the white spaces to tap into to bounce back uh, once the crisis starts looking on the bright side? So. Um, instead of being blindly optimistic, I'd like to first to bring your attention back to the first chapter of the pandemic uh, back in 2020, two years ago. And um, what you're seeing on this graph is the China GDP fluctuations from January 2020 until today. And you can see that uh, China was not only the first country to recover from the crisis, but it only took 80 days to bounce back to a new normal and less than six months to reach levels of growth that exceeded previous increments. Um, you also see a massive surge of consumption and production at the beginning of 2021, uh, when people fully regain trust in the market and therefore in consumption. So what we're looking at here is a true model of economic resilience with great flexibility from the, from the Chinese consumers. And um, although we're, we're seeing everywhere that the economy is plunging and the U.S. growth exceeded China GDP for the first time since 1976, it's important to understand uh, directly on the next slide, if we, if we jump to it, it's important to understand that we're in a situation where people have lots of disposable income, but they don't have the opportunity to spend it. So it's really not a matter of if, but when consumption will restart. And it's absolutely critical for brands to be navigating this transition with uh, agility and most importantly, getting ready for when the Chinese people will start uh, this, this wave of, of revenge shopping. And uh, it's absolutely critical to be aware of um, the consumer sh uh, shifts that are operating right now and being able to navigate them. So this is precisely what we're gonna see and what we're gonna talk about in the second chapter of this um, webinar. Um, basically, yeah, the, the, the consumer shifts. Um, it's, it's important to follow the evolution on Chinese consumers and, and really identify the, the current insights that will determine the, the future consumption triggers. So 
sorry. As you know, um, this is the first tier cities like Shanghai, like Beijing that are the most uh, affected by this lockdown, right? So these tier one consumers are usually uh, the what people call the most sophisticated ones in China with strong desire from uh, innovative and differentiating experiences. But if, if we look at what they truly are craving the most right now, um, and this is a study uh, that was grounded on, on uh, social monitoring. So basically what people are talking about online in T1 cities, what they're craving the most right now is simply a return to normality, to daily life routine, to dining out, to uh, access uh, entertainment, access travel. And if we look at the, the world cloud on the, on the left hand side, we get from uh, online conversations um, that we have, uh, you know, things popping up like as mundane as hair salons, uh, as a supermarket, going to supermarkets, going to the gym. So really this, this, uh, this heavy thirst for normality and the brands who know how to tap into that insight during the lockdowns will be the big winner uh, instead of you know, pushing the usual commercial offers that people cannot even afford uh, to access right now. So as usual, uh, during periods of lockdowns, we have a major surge in screen time with um, over the top services and uh, app users. So we'll explore the, both media in the next few slides to see what is currently buzzing on the Chinese internet and what to do with it. So we're going to start with the, with the app and you can see that, uh, so first the, the takeaway services, the travel and car services like DD are crashing because no one have uh, access to them. Now what's interesting is to look at what is really buzzing. So you can see food recipe websites, mobile games, uh, health and fitness are the top app verticals that people spend the most time on while um, being stuck at home. So uh, we kind of took a little dive into those three, uh, starting with food recipes. So, you know, food was a, was a very uh, important topic because of the food shortages. So people had to deal with uh, very limited supplies and be extremely creative, you know, to come up with those recipes. And this, uh, this pretty much was, was, a, was a buzzword on, on um, you know, those cooking challenges and how to innovate and making dishes using the, the most common and accessible ingredients from the government supply. Um, another uh, trend, especially in the, the Gen Z, was to uh, people starting to grow their own seeds uh, on their balcony. And this also was a, was a, a buzzword and, and a rising trend. Um, the reason for this is the sense of satisfaction uh, of growing your own, uh, um, your own ingredients, but also a reflection of their desire for a simpler country life as key motivator to, to do so. Now, um, we've, we, we mentioned earlier that another type of apps that has been growing is the gaming, uh, gaming apps. So here again, uh, interesting trends. You can look at the, the five played uh, video games uh, in, in April and the top two is Honor of Kings and Game for Peace. They're both uh, from Riot Games that both are owned by Tencent. Tencent is the company that owns uh, WeChat that every Chinese person has on their phone. So it's not a coincidence since e-games are booming in China and Tencent has heavily invested in them, uh, making it one of their uh, largest revenue streams, actually. Um, also, Fantasy Westward Journey from NetEase as well, a huge uh, gaming company uh, that has been getting quite a bit of uh, attraction. So besides an obvious increase in gaming microtransactions, we see two other trends uh, solidifying during COVID. So the first is uh, celebrity live streams where we have uh, uh, big celebrities like uh, Xian Li, like, um, like uh, Zui Ren, uh, essentially appearing uh, live uh, playing so people ca can interact with their favorite uh, celebrities uh, with their favorite games. So this obviously will gain a lot of traction um, during periods of, uh, of lockdown and create a lot of buzz. And also video games is, is something that um, brands, especially luxury brands, have been harnessing um, uh, for quite a long time, for, for quite a few years now, because they see that the potential of this uh, ever-growing audiences. And uh, during lockdown, we had a fila uh, that really displays a, a great sense of agility and collaborated with a, a game for peace, did a collab uh, to release a new collection uh, pop-up. 
that was also featured in, uh, in this uh, video game um, uh, environment. And the last uh, trend I wanted to share with you is about fitness, the, the fitness trends. So something you, you might have heard, perhaps, um, this, uh, this call. So Liu Hong was a... Uh... Okay, uh, maybe they were a little break. So I was, I was sorry, I was talking about the um, Liu Hong for the fitness stress. Um, former singer and actor, and he's currently one of the most popular fitness blogger on, on Douyin. He's gained more than 30 million followers in just a few days at the beginning of the lockdowns because, I mean, the, the, the reason of, of the success is, first of all, Douyin's investment in vertical sectors like fitness, uh, but also the, the, the boom of the fitness market in, uh, in, in, in China that is, of course, extended during periods of lockdown. And uh, Fila, again, very, very agile during this period, was the first international sports label to endorse the couple. And to give you a, a sense of, uh, of uh, media spent for this, we're talking about 2.5 million US dollars for two days live stream, just wearing uh, the Fila uh, gears and, and pushing them in their, in their live stream for, for two consecutive days. So a uh, huge opportunity for the brand here. So this uh, was for the, for the app. Uh, and uh, the, the trends in app. Uh, I also talked about the over-the-top uh, services uh, like Ichi, which is the Chinese Netflix, right? So uh, it's, it's quite interesting to see what's trending on OTT right now. I don't know if you remember in Western countries when, when uh, they had their lockdown, we had some uh, good old mindless entertainment buzzing on Netflix, like with Tiger Kings. I don't know if you remember this, uh, this series. So it's quite interesting to see what makes the buzz uh, in this kind of platforms during periods of lockdown. And here you can see topics are quite different from Tiger King. So you have some uh, military and family themed dramas that really resonate with the consumers with strong emotional value based uh, patriotic and cultural talking points that also gives us some indications of what people like to watch. Uh, to, to, to keep their mind uplifted and you know this food for thought that nurtures online conversations as well. Um, one last consumer trends uh, that I would like to share to wrap up this this uh, this part of the, of the webinar is a very I would say heartwarming phenomenon that um, it was to see you know neighborhoods turning into real connected communities and the most blatant illustration is the surge in group buying. So group buying uh, originated in the, in the rural areas, uh, so you know, in the countryside to get the, the best deals uh, out of buying in bulk. And it has, over the past few years, become a, a rising uh, urban phenomenon. And this has been boosted by the smartphone penetrations, you know, platforms like Pinduoduo, Jingxi, et cetera, where people buy in bulk uh, to benefit from uh, more competitive prices. Now, obviously a huge boom during this period of lockdown with an increase uh, over uh, 70%. And it's funny to see the, the emergence, uh, the rise of a new type of KOL, who would have thought. Basically, in those community uh, buying, you have some leaders that step up and, and organize themselves to connect with the suppliers, negotiate the best rates for their communities. And those people are, uh, are becoming the a new gen KOL. And it's not only for food and drinks or discount group, it's, it's also for uh, private services, a group buy, like, you know, uh, booking a hairdresser for the for your building for example like for example i haven't had the chance to, to to go to a hairdresser for two months now um so you know people are into it or doing like a foot massage so you we, you've probably seen some buzzing pictures on the internet of, of the foot massage through the through the through the gate so this as this is being organized like this also a, a upskill group by like you know a sport coaching or uh, for example photoshop lecture this kind of things that people can do during lockdown um, another spontaneous uh, Good Neighbors initiative also made the buzz on Chinese internet, like intra-community drone uh, deliveries or cooking for the elderly or, or even pet hoarding after the scandals, you know, that spread through the internet uh, about, about the pets. So the reason why um, I'm sharing this about, you know, neighborhoods and group buying is we see a new dynamic in those super busy areas that 
perhaps will be extending in the next few months a uh, uh, new uh, neighborhood like dynamics when it comes to, for example, um, e-commerce uh, uh, buying or this, this type of things. Now, the interesting question is, uh, is how brands are reacting to this situation mm -hmm. and um, we've compiled uh, a selection of cases that we believe are quite relevant and could give you some indication on, on how to steer your strategy and your content for the second semester. Uh, and perhaps then you want to you wanna come in on stage and, and share with us a few of those, uh, a few of those insights. Sure, sure. Um, as you know, like in the in the beginning, uh, Pierre showed a slide of all the business drop down. It's really a strong attack for many brands. Um, basically, many brands who hosted their warehouse in Shanghai because of the lockdown, they cannot ship the product, the products, and the logistic is stopped. So, brands are getting quite panicked. However, um, let's think deeper. You, there is not many things in terms of commercial to push the business conversion uh, during this uh, situation. And some, something is out of the brand's hands. However, um, we can use this opportunity to really think, stay connected in a meaningful way and uh, reach out the wider audience. Let's say prepare now, more solid, and uh, being ready for the future, for when the lockdown lifted, when the business come back. So if we look into the next slide, yeah. So we've identified several ways that the brands are use, using to navigate China's zero policy, COVID policy. First, empathy through donation and showing the compassion. Then capitalizing on brand equity by adjusting the message based on consumer actual priorities. Uh, third, which is digital and innovative experience to provide to our consumers. Since consumers, they really cannot access shopping malls or even get the deliveries in time. So it's a smart way to even uh, dig deeper to connect with them. And the last is shifting away from first tier city and the strict lockdown and embracing lower tier city consumers to sustain the business. So for the next slide, yeah, empathy. Here are a few uh, interesting best practice. So we've seen numerous examples of generosity from multiple brands like uh, uh, Uniqlo who donated to the healthcare workers in various hospitals. Also Pepsi who donated products and encouraged employees to help out in their own communities. Haiti, which is a super popular uh, one popular brand of the bubble tea. I'm sure if you're in China, you've, uh, you, you've tried and you've experienced it in the daily afternoon tea time with, uh, with Haiti. Uh, how they did the collaboration with Shenzhen government on a te uh, testing campaign called the Safe and Happy. The testing campaign, just for you to know, during the uh, lockdown period, many neighborhood or many um, like uh, the, the people living locked, locked in Shanghai, they have to go to test the COVID test every day in order to uh, you can have uh, to test it as positive or negative and they rank different community. If you are in a more safe uh, status or you have a negative case, um, they have different policy for different uh, ty uh, the cases happening on the negative. So the brands are doing this to uh, showing their empathy, understanding and helping for the people in the environment. And uh, at the same time, what the brands bear in mind they're doing is adjust the content according to consumers' priorities. Um, there is one case from Fendi, very interesting. So previously in 2020, we've seen brands offering concerts through social media or exercise classes, uh, which is even more needed nowadays, like in this situation. What Fendi did is to collaborate with professional professional from uh, where, who are trainers in different fields like a yoga teacher, etc. They they offer online courses and uh, meditate, uh, Pilates, Zumba, yoga, even cooking, like how to prepare Italian risotto online. So it's a company for the consumer. Uh, the brand the role is to in this difficult time, um, 
to, to provide you some content to enjoy as well. So the feeling of connection brand is rather less commercial, but more emotionally connected. I think this is quite a smart way. On the right side, you will see uh, what the Prada do. They understood it was not the right time to push commercial offers and started their monthly online culture club, which harnessed the culture heritage of the brand. What they did is they invited film directors, singers, and the writers to recommend their top three picks in their respecting field. And the audience got very excited about the selection. And this got the ball rolling online convention, uh, conversational about the brand. So this kind of thing will last. Consumer once connect with you, they will feel quite attached, uh, increased affinity for the brand. For now, it's the best moment to build and uh, prepare for the future as well. So next the case is from uh, Nike, a bit similar, uh, Nike he picked up the, the China fitness trend and the provide the user of a Nike training club the, uh, to, to continually their journey to the fitness while being indoor, not outdoor. So they have a collaboration with different sport experts uh, to give classes of indoor um, training. So they also made the experience very social with ranking system to reinforce the sense of brand community during the lockdown. The third trend, the third uh, like uh, best practice we observe is digital experience. Um, the idea for digital experience is to maintain access to the offer and the preserve the relationship with the customers or prospect while providing innovative experience. This is one case of Swarovski. Uh, it's a late campaign uh, which blue from us for 520. 520 is a love festival in China on May 20s, which is very much focused on the gifting. And our campaign answered two very specific needs. Uh, Swarovski, just to give a context, Swarovski just rebranded all of their showrooms and they wanted the people to know about it. But the, during the lockdown, no one could actually access it. I, sorry, I, I left the computer has um, ah, it's here. So, um, like the online, bit, one moment, sorry, I need to reopen. I have a connection issue. Do you want me to jump in the time that you're starting? Yeah. Yes, Pierre, maybe. No problem, no problem. So for this case that we've developed for Zvorsky, um, Danny was saying we, we were tapping into very um, specific needs from the consumer so, and from the brand as well. So Zvorsky who just rebranded all of their showrooms. They, um, people, people couldn't really um, access their showrooms during the lockdown. So we had to find a way to, to provide this experience and the second, this kind of festival of 520, it really puts a lot of pressure on the on the male gifters that must select the right gift, uh, which may not be an easy thing, especially if this is the beginning of the relationship, right? So what we came up with is uh, an online shopping platform uh, offering convenience uh, to reproduce the offline couple shopping experience during the 520 festival. So the idea was for the male gifter to be able to fully customize the gifting experience by first uh, selecting the price range he wants to put in the in the gift and then choosing the, the experience environment with a tailored message uh, uploading the, the couple selfie in the crystal frame etc and then he would send it to um to uh, his loved one so after that the other person opens the program and finds the customer uh, the customized interface and they can send, they can select whatever product they want uh, that is already pre shortlisted upon the budget set by the gifter. Uh, you just have to input their delivery information. Then it's pushed back to the gifter to complete the transaction. So it was a very easy way um, for to 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 give access to this uh, new Zvorovsky 2.0 um, experience, shopping experience, and also something very contextual for the for 520. So that's one of first uh, one of the first example. Uh, another example for convenience and access is about uh, Lancôme. So Lancôme is uh, is furthering their their bet in uh, in social commerce with the, the launch of their live stream program on Douyin, the Chinese TikTok. 
and um, the content is quite interactive and, and maintains you know the relationship with existing customers with edutainment content and you can see the the choice of the platform really translate the the strategy for Lancome to reach out to um, to target uh, segments from lower tier cities, as you may know, you know the penetration of doing is higher in those areas. So it's not a coincidence that we see uh, this channel opening during the the lockdown. I can see Danny is back. Do yes. you want me to keep on going, or you? I, I yes. Should, should, I, should I continue? Yes. Uh, no. No. I I I come back. <laughs> Sorry for the. Okay. Little... Perfect. It's, no yes. worries at all. I, I was just uh, wrapping up on the on Doin and the live stream for Lancome. Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, the, uh, the live streaming is a big topic, and um, you've seen in the, from the past year until now, it is still the main method for many brands to continue to engage with consumer and the shifting first from Taobao, and now Doin is really in the spotlight. However, the Doin live streaming has a slightly uh, different positioning compared to others for what the Lancome did is to have their doing offering the experience to connect with consumer, but also uh, aiming to connect with lower tier city of consumers. Uh, this is the best platform you can reach out a new segment. And also during the lockdown uh, in maybe in the Shanghai, it's more difficult to do the e-commerce. However, you have a wide other tier two, tier three city to run the business. So doing live streaming still works. And this is the, uh, during this lockdown, Lancome take the message to open. And then we found another very interesting digital experience run directly on Taobao, where Taobao Live and the Luxury Pavilion team up for a very uh, pretty cool avatar creation. So where you can try uh, on your looks from the different the selected brands and the put your outfit together and the purchasing it on in one click. Basically, it's like uh, the, the QQ show before, but now it's advanced version. So you have your own avatar, you can experience it and, uh, and the change what it is. It's very convenient, smooth to, to go through it. The ambition here is for brand is to develop the brand affinity with younger generation. Uh, which is pr uh, pretty clear and uh, quite effective. As we observe, uh, there was substantial buzz around this activation on social with all the customers posting their picture of their avatars. So from the, the next, this is an uh, interesting one. It's a collaboration of Adidas Original and the TME Land. So at the beginning of the year, Tencent made its debug into the metaverse with an online music festival called the Timeland that people could join in from QQ Music. Uh, just for you to know, QQ Music uh, is a joint venture between Tencent and Spotify, where people can listen to the music freely um, by subscription. So this music festival was about creating your own avatar and joining in the concerts virtually. It's pretty cool. So Adidas original extended the invitation and the collaborate with uh, Timeline last week to launch their own festival in OZ World to promote the launch of the collection. So basically user, uh, when they want to join the, the concert online, they can create their own avatar styled with the latest products and the sneakers uh, from, from the brands. And uh, they can interact in the concert. They can click the button, turn around the, the, the circle. You can jump. Uh, it's like online like clubbing while you're listening to a concert. So it's, it's this experience is a sign like a brands are looking forward or starting to observe in a digital world providing interactive experience even entering the metaverse so for the yeah the last case i'd like to share on digital experience is a bit different it's more about the new generation of digital influencers that are now exploding after Beijing's crackdown on celebrities and influencers, uh, which turned out to be a great strategy to um, sidestep lockdown as brands do not need to deal with the uh, physical shooting production with celebrity or with uh, influencer. So the digital one turned out to be uh, quite a good option for them. Uh, 
So here is an example of a clever client they collaborating with a digital influencer like uh, Salix, who has more than 4 million followers on Weibo, and uh, Xing Tong, who is the Bilibili digital influencers. The, uh, we also observed during the lockdown period, brands are tackling lower tier cities to reinforce their presence where the restrictions are not as strict as in Beijing and Shanghai. Um, let's have a look at a few brands. So the first one is Elena Rubinstein. They have a pop exhibition in Chengdu which talk about the heritage of the brand. Uh, it's quite successful. Chengdu is also uh, one of the rising cities where luxury brands are all focusing on. The consum consumption power is high um, and the people are quite free compared to Shanghai and, uh, and Beijing. This is a great strategy to adopt. Also, uh, Louis Vuitton, they have a pop-up exhibition in Qingdao. Uh, this is a city where they have a popular like sailing activities. So Louis Vuitton uh, wept a fleet in the LV boats to make the campaign pop up uh, exhibition there. Also Michael Kors and uh, they did the IP, uh, IP collaboration and the pop up is in Wuhan and Shenzhen tapping into winter sport and the tennis trend in China. So which is to say um, when many brands enter in China or they're in China, they always think about the Beijing and Shanghai. Of course, it is the first city where you, you build up your brands and you have an important business. However, the tier two, tier three cities during the lockdown shows great potential and the brands keep doing activities, leveraging this window time to engage with consumers there. Another very recent example is the rise of um, uh, to fame of the influencer Dian Di La Hai. I'm not sure if you seen some uh, videos from him. It's quite interesting. Uh, maybe uh, Anita, you can play the video to to show them how it is. Uh, I will let the, the video in in while explaining. So the, the, this guy produced quite a funny content. He basically in, um, emulates the looks from top luxury brands uh, in a super rural DIY setup. As you can see, he take a, a t-shirt uh, and, and then he prepared and he suddenly transformed into a cool, like a big magazine photo shooting result with YSL, uh, with take LV and Gucci, etc. So he gained more than 5 million followers during last month. And the many brands like Lancome, uh, George Armani started to collaborating with him. He's quoted just a, uh, like uh, like increasing a lot for for example like a one to 20 second video has sold from 25k to 80k rmb for a six vi uh, second video it increased from 40k to 100k rmb this is a great example that today look to, to demonstrate the luxury brands should not see their audience as just the purchasers but as co-creator because actively this will actively encourage people to participate in the creative process, which is a way to attract the young shoppers to our brand in the long term. So for the next chapter, we will share with you where the future opportunities. Yes, so th this, this brings us to the, um... To the last part uh, um, of our of our webinar, and um, we can see uh, we we've picked this uh, illustration on the on the next on the next slide as uh, that is quite interesting. So, especially when you when you have an environment that is very volatile, it's, it usually goes with the you know the pressure to shift gear from a, a long term brand building strategy to a short term performance marketing that uh, you know that drive quick sales. Um, especially the, the digitalizations of marketing that has uh, accelerated this dichotomy even more and, and led the marketers to sometimes believe uh, that this is a binary um, decision. And this is even more true in China uh, on the next slide where brands uh, have been overusing celebrities and overusing influencers as a way to drive a short-term success for their campaigns. 
um, and it could be very um, risky, a risky strategy. Uh, as I'm sure you, you know, China started their equality and common prosperity campaign uh, last year. They ran a massive crackdown on celebrity culture, you know, the glorification of wealth, the fan economy, and what they call the distorted beauty standards. And last year uh, in China, they, they saw big names like Chris Wu, like Deng Run, like Via, uh, fall into controversy. And, and, and for some brands, these adaptations meant a shift towards safer ambassadors in 2022, like uh, elite athletes. And this, this transformation of the market is even uh, accelerating even more with the lockdown, with the restrictions. So in this context, you know, brands really need to rethink their, their go-to short-term tactics and, 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 and start reinforcing their brand equity-based uh, long-term strategies, especially that the economical future is yet uncertain uh, with stricter measures, uh, major techni technological shifts, sorry, uh, that should encourage the brands to maximize the compound effects of getting short-termism and long-termism working together. And uh, just to leave you just with uh, some food for thoughts, um, I, I leave you with this interesting graph and, and, how, to, and how the power of, of short and long-term effect combinations can improve your brand performance. And uh, this beautiful quote from uh, Tom Roach, the, the head of Strat from Jellyfish, he basically says something that I, that I found uh, uh, incredibly smart. Uh, brand should create long-term communication engineered for immediate uh, success. So we leave this graph behind. You can uh, apply it to your brand and your own communications. Uh, and a perfect illustration of this graph is how Prada uh, has been handling their strategy in China. Uh, and Prada has been, you know, the precursor of uh, in avoiding this, uh, those big traffic star uh, celebrities by shifting gear towards uh, athlete uh, spokesperson. Um, so for their uh, spring summer 22 campaign, uh, they, they collaborated with some uh, Beijing Olympians and the video racked up over 46 million views on Douyin. Um, also uh, putting, to, putting together a, a risk adverse challenge strategy by expanding their social commerce ecosystem uh, with the recent opening of their uh, red uh, channel, Xiaohongshu Red, um, supported you know, by the, the consumer centric contents, extremely relevant to consumers like the online culture cloud that we mentioned earlier during the, the lockdown. Uh, also for Prada, um, they've been uh, slowly, but on the next slide, uh, slowly but surely establishing those, those uh, highly curated experiences that are contributing to the long-term brand equity uh, like the this recent opening of Prada uh, Rongjai. So the, the Prada Rongjai is a historical uh, 19, 1918 residence in the heart of, uh, of Shanghai um, that the Prada group completely renovated as a space, you know, dedicated to various cultural activities, uh, exhibitions, etc. cetera. Um, also, they would dive into local Chinese culture uh, to create uh, su uh, surprising installations. Like uh, late last year, they did a, uh, a pop-up wet market in Shanghai. They were not even selling products. They were just, it was just a PR stunt. They went to wet market and completely rebranded it as a, as Prada. Um, so this was like a huge buzz that of course contributes to their brand equity, even, even until now in the, in the spirit of, of, of lockdown. And this uh, PR actions, of course, paired with more tactical operational, uh, like uh, Prada ice pop-up right before the Beijing Olympics, uh, uh, focusing on, on winter sports. And more recently, uh, I mean, just a few few days ago, uh, the Prada um, uh, Tropical pop-ups to anticipate the, the summer campaign. So this is a beautiful example how a brand is uh, shifting away from the quick win of uh, uh, big celebrities, big influencers, and just like slowly but surely building, uh, capitalizing on the, on, the, on the brand message, on the, 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 the harnessing, you know, this cultural heritage that is so true to Prada and building upon this uh, year after year in China. So, to, so the brand really uh, is, is anchored as top of mind for luxury in, uh, in Chinese consumers' mind. Um, so, so this uh, short-term versus long-term was, uh, was the first thing I wanted to talk about. The second thing, uh, you know, while, you know, ongoing content can be part of long-term equity strategy, um, there are unmissable, unmissable bets for the rest of the year for the e-commerce festival to secure commercial success, um, especially after the, this, this Q2 that can be very challenging for some brands. So quite fortunately, 
uh, the e-commerce hallmarks are, 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 there's a lot of them in China. And the majority of the work is basically what we do here at iBlue, you know, campaign like uh, 618, you can see uh, the one we did, uh, the, um, the Chinese Valentine's Day campaign we did for Valentino, or the bottom image is the WFM campaign we did for Lancôme. So the, 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 the key for those KCP this year will be to prioritize conversion, uh, sorry, conversion-based influencers for those short-term campaigns while pushing forward uh, star products and you know the timeless products as well that are considered as uh, investment pieces because um, it might be risky to immediately push you know seasonal unnecessary products assortments that could potentially flop during those uh, those KCP. So we recommend here you know to really uh, capitalize on those uh, on those hero products for your brands and those uh, high conversion paired with like we've like we've seen just before uh, ongoing content uh, that will be part of your long term uh, equity strategy. Um, also, a third thing, uh, a third opportunity um, would be to exploring new digital formats. And uh, before we play the video, I just would like to, to give a bit of context for it. This is a, a great example of a case we did last year for a brand called Shuemura from the L'Oreal Group. And Shuemura um, did an um, uh, Asia Pacific launch for, for their brand for a new lipstick. Um, and in, originally, they wanted to do an offline event, invite all the influencers from, uh, from Asia Pacific in Tokyo. Unfortunately, they had to cancel it because of the COVID and they replaced it uh, with uh, an online event. Uh, so they tasked iBlue to come up with a fully immersive, interactive uh, experience that would substitute to this offline event. So it's a very short video, it's one minute, and in just a, a few slides you can you can see what this is about. I'll let you play the video maybe with the sound. Okay, I'm not sure we have the sound, but it's it's fine. So what we did is this um, digital platform where people were traveling from Tokyo to Kyoto. So um, in Tokyo, we had a, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, mini workshop with the makeup artists, uh, discovering the products, uh, discovering different looks uh, through interactive videos, and then in a Kyoto environment, it was a whole gamified journey with the five senses where you had to, to touch the, sc the, the the screen for see the, the hear with ASMR experiences uh, to taste it. We had those little cakes made out of pigments uh, where it was interactive videos and the replicating the smell of it. So it was very much like uh, based on the different um, uh, sen sensorial, uh, sensorial impressions. Uh, people also could make their own avatar, customize it, post it on social media uh, as animated GIFs. So a fully interactive, immersive experience that we've developed for Shumura as a way to substitute. And the takeaway here is fully embracing um, uh, this multi-dimensional consumer journey to offset the lack of physical relationship during a crisis period. Um, still talking about innovative digital formats. I mean, um, we have to talk about the, the, met the metaverse. It's uh, whether we, we love it or not, uh, it's happening in China. There's already uh, more than 500 uh, companies uh, registered that are developing their own metaverse to a, a small or huge scale. So of course, the, the the massive uh, 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 Chinese companies are already on it, like Baidu with their app uh, Shirong, uh, which, uh, which uh, can be accessible through uh, virtual reality uh, devices. Uh, Tencent, of course, with the QQ Music, we saw for the, the timeline. Uh, Alibaba, who launched uh, the MetaHuman, you know, IAE, you can see the picture of the, of the blonde hair lady. She's a, she's a digital influencer. The market is absolutely huge. Uh, estimated to be um, over 8 trillion US dollars, according to Morgan Stanley. And uh, the prediction indicates that 37 million Chinese online users will have a virtual identity on the metaverse platforms by uh, 2025. And the way brands can utilize the metaverse uh, to their advantage is by implementing communication strategies that serve all levels of consumer interactions and prepare for new consumer behaviors to be um, uncovered, you know, that wouldn't necessarily be possible in real life. So one way is through e-commerce, um, e-commerce based experience optimizations like virtual idols, 
uh, uh, immersive shopping. And you have brands like, like Dior, or like Montclair, they already started to do experiences like this. Like, um, like for example, Dior did this, uh, this uh, digital museum in the, in the metaverse in collaboration with a very famous architect that built a, a museum in the metaverse that people could uh, access to. So a lot of brands have already took a step in that direction, unlocking new methods of, of luxury and experiences through virtualizations, um, which makes you know, a lot of sense since the consumer are searching for seamless real to virtual experiences through uh, those multidimensional consumer journeys. Um, so yeah, just to, just to touch on the, on the NFT topic, uh, probably you're already aware, but the NFT, uh, sorry, crypto, crypto mining, crypto mining and trading, um, were prohibited across China last year, um, to prevent, you know, environmental damage, fraud, money laundering, etc. So NFT developments, uh, will be a crypto less in China. Uh, and so we have to, we have to, to redefine basically the purpose of those NFT in China. And uh, we already know that they will be used more as collectibles than financial products uh, or as certificates, you know, of ownership for, for, for digital assets and IP pr uh, protections. So we can expect the, the minting, publishing and sales and transaction of NFT to, to continue uh, to be very regulated in the, in the future as, as well. And with that in mind, brands will have to rethink how their tokens can be, uh, can, can, can produce, can offer, you know, long lasting value in order to appeal to consumers looking to invest into NFT because the approach is completely different than in the West where you have, you know, uh, this uh, transactional value of the, of the NFT. So this is still the premises and already uh, big platforms, even like the uh, last double 11, JD already uh, was promoting their digital uh, collectibles um, through uh, Lucky Draws, etc. So this is already happening. And um, the last part that I would like to touch on for future opportunities is travel retail. I know uh, it can sound weird because we're, everyone is still in, uh, in lockdown, but China will reopen one day. And, um, and uh, as you probably know, uh, you probably heard, you know, Hainan is a, is a very sunny island in the south of China and is the favorite destination for Chinese families. And part of that reason is um, it's travel free, uh, sorry, it's shopping free, uh, uh, tax free shopping um, that has beaten all records for the first two months of the year, uh, over 1.9 billion USDs in just two months. Um, that's more than a third over what they did last year. Uh, so investing in this travel retail location is, is always a good idea, it's 70% uh, uh, of the population either plan to visit or have already visited Hainan and 50% either have definitive plan to travel there or are considering making uh, a trip there when, uh, when China will, will reopen. So this pretty much concludes um, the, the future opportunities. So as a conclusion, you know, it's, it's, I just want to share that it's, it's obvious that, you know, the, the store closures will impact the brand's bottom line uh, for Q2. However, it's uh, it's highly doubtful that there will be long-lasting impact on the on their performance. So the the lockdown will create these temporary challenges and setbacks, but most luxury business should already have you know some contingency strategies in place to uh, mitigate revenue losses and ensure business continuity. So, um, to conclude, we really recommend for brands to remain agile, to remain uh, adaptive, and align their marketing strategies and tactics with. KPIs that can be achieved through established tactics and also having insights into the consumers is the best way to stay connected and top of mind with the consumers across platforms um, and, uh, and so, you know, all the channels that they spend time on. And um, just uh, last thing, you know, finally in investing in trusted and, and robust data sources is always money well spent. Uh, during this transitional uh, period. So I don't know, Danny, if you would like to, to, to give like a, a last note before we, we jump into the, the Q&A session. Um, I think uh, we have some audience make, uh, making a very interesting question, which link to what uh, I would like to share. Uh, first, we have the, let, let's start the Q&A. First, we have a question from Chen Xi who asked, uh, how should the brands leverage the in live stream to reach both sales and the branding objective. Um, for, like Pierre said, you remember in the slide, there is a door 
uh, the first door is long-term brand building. The second door is the short-term like sales conversion. Um, during the mini discussion with clients, I asked them, okay, what do you see for the next half of year? It's true. Many of the clients locally in China, they say, okay, the first objective is to make up the, all the sales lost in the first of uh, first half of year, so they want to go aggressive to take the method of more conventional marketing way. Um, I think this lends to the question of Chen Xi asked because this is a uh, something always from brand headquarters side they were concerned that the, how the brand balance goes. Sales and the brand is not a contradictionary, I would say, and you can realize in Douyin live streaming directly the same goal during good content. Uh, which will be to carefully to define uh, your content program. Don't think about the Douyin live streaming is a sales shopping TV program. Uh, it's not. It can be your brand experience platform. You can curate very interesting content, interactive content, invite the relevant uh, guests uh, to the program to share in a more elevated way. And sometimes hard promotion, uh, you can get the sales, but it doesn't mean you can get the sales always. So you always need to have the branding in the sales in the, in the sales. For for example, um, let's say some of client doing the skincare instead of doing the promotion in the doing live streaming, um, they invite the scientists, they invite the uh, the skincare experts, influencer to talk about the, the product, talk about the brand value, etc. This is a way to build the branding, but help for the sales conversion because consumer really convinced deeply of the brand, but not the, just by the uh, half price promotion. So in a way, uh, I would say the program design is very important to balance which topic uh, you're going to launch in the doing live streaming and uh, also uh, the the speaker you are engaging uh, and the, the whole environment setting, the background, even the way of talking uh, in the live streaming of doing is quite a key to leverage both. Then we have a, a second question. Um, the, the question is, there is a many brands uh, leveraging metaverse concept, but how can brand can be differentiated and stand out in the metaverse? Pierre, you would like to answer this question? Uh, yes, sure. So first of all, it's still the premises of the of the metaverse. And a little bit like when uh, Facebook was launched, there were different Facebooks and then the Facebook kind of came out and became the, the, the preferred one for all the brands. So we're kind of at this stage right now where you have different metaverse with people exploring and playing a lot on different metaverse so the the the, the music festival is a, is a good example with with adidas that went through the music route then um another route was what dior did with the, the collaboration with the, um the collaboration with the, the architects to do uh, this this dior pavilion in the in the shirong metaverse and doing a, a art exhibition there so i think what's going to be differentiating here is the level of creativity of the yeah. brands and how uh, they will expand um, their their brand message creatively into uh, into a new uh, into a new environment where pretty much the, the sky is the, is the limit because it's a, it's a virtual environment so yeah. I think creativity and uh, staying true to your to your brand uh, identity and your brand mm -hmm. origins will be the the main differentiating factor here Mm, I totally agree. Uh, we have two more questions. Um, one is for the small brands who doesn't have that much resources during the in terms of business size, business stage, and how they what is the priority for the brands to react during the situation. So it's a quite a challenging question, huh? <laughs> I would say. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, sorry, my internet jumped. Uh, no worries. Um, maybe this question is uh, my, my, I have some idea how to address 
this uh, this topic. It links to the question from Emma. Oh, so Emma okay. asked, uh, do you see KOC playing a more relevant role in the brand building given the current market contribution? And additionally, what are the some recommend uh, Additionally, what are the recommendation for brands to navigate Xiaohongshu latest rules? So uh, I, I will share some um, my opinion to link all, all these three questions. It's true that uh, today for smaller brands, um, they have less resources, and it's even more important back to the core, I would say. What is back to the core is to um, make your brand shine, crafting your right narrative, your right product positioning, uh, you're right, a true benefit for consumer. This is uh, some work has to redefine it because many brands w before was um, quite easy, not not that easy, but uh, you have more opportunity. Once the market's big and the growth is fast, you can make a uh, make up your money quickly. And the consumer, the, the consumption behavior is uh, quite uh, by tendency, like you can endorse with influencer to influence them. And uh, when product is popular, they will buy and then the, and the, then they have launched a new product to sell, push, etc. But nowadays, I would say first of all, consumer are more rational and they prefer to spend the money on the true, really good products. So for smaller brands, we need to ask ourselves, like, uh, are we as a brand, uh, our offer is uh, good enough and should we retouch a little bit our offer to be more competitive in the market? And in terms of marketing, um, I would say still, influencer can be an interesting method to take, uh, but more um, a combination way, not a, not only big influencer like celebrity, not only the KOC is a, is a we call the KOS, like a key opinion mix strategy to really design your content pillar. Some influencer are more in the role to talk about the uh, practice, uh, practically uh, user like uh, feedbacks, benefit of the brands. Some are more for ins inspirational. So it's uh, not a, a huge resources to put, but the, those resource investing influencer can be beneficial to create a content, to drive the popularity, and uh, to increase your SEO uh, in that. Right. If I, I just would like to add something a little bit more operational uh, regarding Emma's question about Xia Hongshu um, and the KOC, I think yes, KOC is a different is a definitely a great avenue because Red is a, is a content and impression oriented platform, not necessarily a follower based platform. So this is kind of the uh, what the algorithm is is based on. So the more mention you have through the through the KOC, the better it will be. However, you need to be controlling the, the quality of the output of your KOCs uh, because now the content is more and more quantitative on red and you want your brand to be uh, shaped through your KOC. So this goes through um, uh, a very clear set of guidelines that you need to share with your with your KOC. So this is also part of the job that we're doing at iBlue, you know, creating those influencer guidelines to make sure to have very qualitative contents all throughout the, the, the layers of your, your, your pyramid of, uh, of influence from your top to KOLs all the way to the KOCs, as well as, at the, as the rules of engagement that we're establishing for the, the, the bottom layer. So if you want to, to know more about uh, more tactical engagements, uh, um, you, can, um, you can download, you know, in the handouts, you have the presentation of today that we've put in the handouts. You can click and download. In the last slide, we have our contact information. So just drop us an email to keep the conversations about this, and we can help you um, to, to 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 navigate, especially the the, the bottom of this of this uh, uh, funnel. But yes, you're right. KOC will be part of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, Pierre. Thanks, everybody who joined this session. Thanks, everyone who joined. Yes. Yeah, we had a very insightful session, the productive conversation about uh, this topic. So I hope it will be useful. Yeah. Uh, don't forget to download the, the presentation. And if you have any needs, you can directly find our contacts. Thank yeah. you. Feel free to, to reach out to us. Thank you very much to everyone that attended this session. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Bye.